Hey, what it do is your big homie Jazzy R E W D holding your deal W N because I'm always feeling G R E A T Jazzy Red Man. You're checking out my big homie Donnie Houston. That's right, in the H, baby. That's how we do it. Yeah, man, it's going down this Donnie Houston podcast. I am Donnie Houston. Check it out, man. Um, we got a special guest, man. I'm talking about <laughs> a, a, a legend. You know what I'm saying? H Town legend, man. I'm talking about go all the way back, man. To early, early Houston, you know what I'm saying? Put out the uh, first rap record, you know what I mean? Um, to come out of the city, you know what I'm saying? Uh, came back with a classic, uh, I'm a dope fiend, you know what I'm saying? In the midst of that, did Kids Jam and just a host of other things, man, to still put it down today. Hey, man, uh, Jazzy Red, what's going down? What's the deal, man? Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, baby. But, but, you know what? I'm just kind of, um, uh, just, just feel good finally be in the building, man. You know, been trying to get here for a long time. So, you know, uh, I'm here, man. Thank you for uh, bringing your boy out, man. Thank you for keeping me on, on your radar, too, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's been a long time, man. I've been, uh, you know, been, been doing a lot uh, since... Um, since the early early days, the, the very beginning of, of hip hop culture in Houston, so you know, and done all that all these years, and still pretty. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, really, man. So what? So what you doing these days, man? I know you're not in H no more. You in what, Beaumont? Well, yeah, I'm back and forth. You know, transition from from you know, I'm always this this my home, man. You know, um, uh, just Houston, uh, bred, born and raised. You know, um, but uh, yeah, still still doing uh, what I've been doing. You know, since the early days. You mentioned about the uh, the first uh, rap record in Houston. Uh, go research it, man. Check it out. Nin- 1983, I uh, did a, re- a record called Breakdancing with the uh, Chance Band. It was an R&B band in Houston, uh, Roger Cummins, Steve Cummins, two brothers, uh, they had this uh, idea to put a record out called Breakdancing. So, man, and uh, they contacted me to, uh, uh, they, they needed a rapper, so they contacted me to do a, uh, put a rap on it. Um, I did that, and uh, uh, that was it, man. Uh, you know, back then, you know, everything was live. It's all live instruments, live band. Uh, uh, you know, everything had live drums, guitar, keyboard, synthesizers. You know, no drum machines back then, so everything was just live, man. So we recorded that record, and uh, uh, yeah, it came out pretty good, man. You know. It, it, it was what it was for the time. We didn't put out too many copies. You know, we have a very limited uh, amount of copies on releases on on that song. But um, yeah, breakdancing man in 1983, the Chance how, Band. You said they came and found you. How did they even know to come and find you to come do the rap? Like, what were you doing at that time? Well, I was um, was I on Kids Jam then? I think I think I may have been on Kids Jam then, but I was I was just popular through the city. I was just rapping, you know. Uh, shout out to my man, uh, R.I.P. the Wiki Cricket, man. Cricket, um, uh, if anybody know uh, the early days of Houston and downtown, we used to hang out downtown a lot. You know, everybody used to hang out downtown. It was an old shoe store in, in downtown called Hardy's. Hardy Shoes, man. That's where all the, you get all, all the players, all, you know, all, all the name brand shoes and stuff. And so we used to r- stand downtown in front of Hardy's rapping. And, uh, you know, we just, I just, just just had a name throughout the city, you know, before I went to uh, a Kids Jam and Cricket, uh, Cricket brought me to, to Kids Jam, as a matter of fact. And and I'm, I'm assuming they heard me through uh, being on, on the station over at uh, Choice 90.9. So, yeah. OK, because you, you go so back yeah, early, so early, but we got to yeah. back it up a little bit. OK, what side of town <laughs> did you come up on? Well, I was uh, uh, raised up in Second Ward and Fourth Ward. So Second Ward uh, is where my early day. That's when I uh, was in. A, I lived in Clayton Homes. That's projects in Clayton. Uh, and uh, Second Ward called Clayton Homes, right on uh, Canal, Ronalds, Ronalds and Canal. And uh, grew up there. Uh, went to Jeff Davis. Uh, graduated from Jeff Davis and went to U of H for a year. Stayed a year in college. Cause I think I went to college too too early man you know after i got out of high school so i was like shit on i'm you know i didn't want no more college so i did a year and 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 i bounced so uh then later on we moved to fourth ward so you know i grew up in second ward and fourth ward mm. so yeah my my, my grown-up years my teenage years was in was in uh fourth ward mostly early early 20s late 20s so when so when did you start messing with, with the music and all that uh in high school I was DJing since high school. I DJ. My mom was a nurse uh, for 20 years. Uh, she um, she was at Jeff Davis <laughs> Hospital, and I went to Jeff Davis High School. My mom was a nurse at Jeff Davis, and she had a, a Christmas party one day, and I uh, I DJ. She bought me a home. I had a home stereo, uh, a little microphone. Me and my cousin Ike, Ike's Ike, and uh, yeah, I was DJing a little Christmas party, man. So yeah, I've been doing it since early on, since uh, right out of high school, 83, 84. 
So yeah. out of high school, you start DJing. Out of high school, you start you do this rap record. All this happens all around the same time. Uh, well, after high school, uh, after I started DJing, um, I, uh, I, I, I started rapping. You know, and when, when rap came out in the 80s, 80, 80, 80, 83, 84, 82, you know, rap came out, then I heard it. Got hooked on that, man. You know, of course, hearing Run DMC and those guys, Curtis Blow. You know, Kurt came up the Christmas rapping in 79. Heard those guys and, and started rapping myself. So, um, and then, yeah, I, I, I was doing mostly rapping first. That's that's what I was doing first. So, like I said, I did that with the Chance Band, did that breakdancing song. And then um, uh, in 84, 80, uh, 85, 86, I had my own uh, label, Red Smoke Records, with me and uh, Jerry Smoking B. Okay, wait, wait. But before that, take me to Kids Jam, though. Take me to join the Kids Jam. Kids Jam came about cricket, introduced me to Lester at Kids Jam around 84, 83, 84, somewhere up in there. Cricket uh, took me to say, man, you need to come see Lester, man. Kids Jam over here. So he took me to see Lester. Me and Lester met, and that was it. After that, I was on Kids Jam. That, that was my thing. I, I was the master rapper on Kids Jam. Every Saturday, every week, I did a different rap. Started off live. You know, I did all the live raps. Then uh, we started recording them a little later on because Pam Collins, you know, she you know, might say something crazy. So she said, we're going to start recording this just in case. You know, so, um, yeah, that's what I was doing, the master rapper. And I was on the air with Lester, me and Lester. So it was just, you know, it was me and Lester. And, you know, all the kids, everybody on Kids Jam was teenage. He was all teen. I was, Cricket was, of course, the oldest. He was older than all of us. He was like our big brother. And um, me and Lester uh, was a, maybe a few, couple of years older than the rest of the kids. All them kids was 13, 14 years old, man, 15, 16. So, you know, we were teenagers. So it was uh, it was dope, man. It was. Uh, can, can you talk about who Ricky Cricket was at that time in Houston? Like, you know. Cricket was uh, just well known as far as. Um, he he played basketball. He was well known for hooping. Cricket can hoop, man. He he short. He was a guard. He hooped in school. And um, I, I lived in Clayton home. And Cricket went with a girl that uh one of my homeboys' sister. He went with her. So Cricket used to come over to Clayton home from Fifth Ward all the time. You know, Kelly Cole. Those that you know. I went. To, I went. Matter of fact, I went to Bruce too. So I, so I got the, the the both sides of the track from Fifth Ward and Fourth Ward. That's why I, a lot of my friends from Fifth Ward and stuff. We went to uh, Bruce. And then we went to Anson Jones, and we went to. Um, uh, I wanted to go to Wheatley so bad, man. I wanted to play basketball for Wheatley so bad, but then they zoned us. I was crying, man. I was like, damn, they zoned. So we had to go to Jeff Davis. I wanted to go to E.O. Smith and Wheatley, because all my friends was there from 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 kindergarten. I was like, damn, man, I gotta go. So I went play ball over there at Jeff Davis. I played uh, through junior high and high school, uh, uh, starting forward, and. Um, so Cricket took me to 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 meet Lester, and that was it, man. Okay, and, talk uh, about yeah. what Kids Jam meant to the city at that time. How important was that? Because y'all were the only place that got rap, like consistent mm-hmm. rap. You knew for a fact Saturday morning you can turn you can tune into Kids Jam. You are gonna have rap on the radio. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. man. Every Saturday, you know, um, ten to two, ten a.m. to two p.m. We was on, um, uh, just playing all the all the late. It, it first started off with. Um, uh, Lester, you know, was there before everybody. Lester was kind of like the the, the the captain of of the ship, and he was there before before us with Stacy Porter, Charles uh, Charles Porter Senior was the, uh, the the program director there, and Pam Collins. Uh, he was the, the the general manager, and Pam Collins was the program director at that time. And um, so it it started off. Lester had the idea to to bring rap to play rap music because Pam Collins was kind of against uh, rap at that time. And uh, Lester say, okay, let's go ahead and uh, start playing this rap music. And when he started putting the rap on, you know, the lines started lighting up, and it was just a whole different thing. And and um, was it Kids Jam before rap, or rap made it Kids Jam? It was the the rap made it Kids Jam. It was uh, I forgot what the name of it was. Uh, it was just a choice. It was something else. They were calling it something else before uh, before the name Kids Jam came. I think Lester had a lot to do with the with the name Kids Jam. Cause it was for kids. It was ran by kids, and it was for the youth. You know, for for young young kids at that time. And at that time in the city, man, it was just you know it was just that. You know, uh, people were just listening to um, uh, that station because it was the only station that played rap, of course, at that time. And 
man, every Saturday morning, that's the place. And I was on rapping, you know, we rapping live on the radio. We scratching, we saying all kind of crazy. We just, we, we clowning, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and that's just, that's just how it stemmed out, man. And every Saturday morning, when you go to the car wash, man, and get your car washed and just, you know, hanging out at, at, at the parks, McGregor Park, shout out to Daryl Scott. And, uh, yeah, man, just, um, uh, that that's that, that that was the thing to listen to at that time. So yeah, we were just not knowing what it would be, what what it is today. You know, we were just out, we were just doing our thing. You know, as mm. kids, just making it's just a new thing, and y'all just having a good time with it. Yeah, man, rap was new in the city of Houston. Of course, you know we was behind on a lot of shit, man. Because Houston at that time, we you know New York, the East Coast, they get stuff. We get it like a few years later, five years later, two or three years later. Man, that's old. Oh, we just get this is new to us. So you know, we were kind of. Slow as far as um uh, getting music and stuff from hip hop so yeah that was just a, it, it was just a thing to, to listen to on Saturday mornings can you yeah. clear something up clear something up cuz yeah. i've had people tell me Jazzy Red was the one to slow the record down with the freshest of the word and i'm mm-hmm. like can you take is that any truth to that whole thing yeah well i i, I didn't I, I i can't take credit for slowing the record down but uh who did? I think Les, Lester did that. See, we had a record, Fresh is the Word, by a group called Mantronic, right? It was a it was a it, it was a twelve inch record, but it played on forty five. The speed was forty five. Normal speed of a, of a twelve inch is thirty three and a half. So Lester say, uh, slow it down, put it on thirty three. We put it on thirty three. And the uh, then the record was just going slow. It sounded like it was it was screwed. You know that term wasn't invented then but yeah it was slowed down and it was fresh is the word the, the, the real funky man and uh, so we just uh, we, we did it like that every week and and people was tripping when they heard it like that and it was it was a couple other records we slowed down too um i think uh, uh big butts a couple of instrumentals we slowed down they played on 45 we just slowed them down and put them on 33 and and just went slow, and that was the uh, kind of the beginning of, of what now is called Screw, you know, uh, set off by my man, uh, DJ Screw. And, um, yeah, so that's that's what it was. A lot and of that people, started with you and Lester Sir Pace, just... Yeah, man, that was, we did that shit. We did that in, like, 80, what, 85, somewhere up in there, 84, 85. Yeah, Screw probably was a baby then, you know, mm. a little kid. <laughs> and this before yeah. Daryl Scott even like played around with it as well too, because he got into it later on as well. Yeah, right? yeah, that was for Daryl. Daryl was Daryl actually. Daryl was uh, uh, he used to send, have mixes and stuff played on Kids Jam before I came. So Daryl kind of already had some mixes uh, that was played on Kids Jam before I came, but they wasn't you know wasn't nothing screwed or slowed down on it. But he was just doing his mixes and stuff. So yeah, Daryl man been in the game for a while, man. That's that's my boy, and um, all of us kind of, kind of, you know, stem from that from from that same era. You know, the very beginning of hip hop, man, in Houston was early early '80s, like '82, '83. That's when we first started getting hip hop. And uh, like I say, East Coast had it uh, before then, like '79 in the late '70s. You know, so yeah. And uh, I I just want people to to realize that you know, like like when rappers uh, from New York mention. You know, like even LL or, or or Run, they always revert back and say, "Man, you know, got to shout out to Cool Herc and you know Africa Bambata and all those guys that came before them." I would like for you know any any historians or historians, you know, people that want to make documentaries or or write books and stuff about Houston to kind of reach back and know, you know, no disrespect to nobody, you know, because everybody from Houston, man, we got a lot of talent, a lot of talented artists, a lot of talented people. Uh, they're just doing so many good things, a lot, of, a lot of dope rappers, producers, and so on and so forth. But in the same breath, when they do these documentaries and stuff, kind of reach back and kind of start from the beginning. I know, you know, we love Screw, we love UGK, and we love uh, the Ghetto Boys and Rap A Lot and Jay Prince and all those guys, man. They started on Kids Jam. <laughs> you know where they think they get their stuff from? Who you, who, who you think played the first uh, uh, rap a lot record? Car Freak. Yeah, they came to came to us, man. We played that record, man. That was from Raheem the Vigilante. Was was mm. the Ghetto Boy and uh, uh, Prince uh, 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 Sir Jukebox and Prince Johnny C and all those guys and Bushwick, man. Yeah, man. So you know, just just kind of come back and say, okay, these are the guys that kind of pioneered. You know, and just you know, just just give us a pay a little homage, give a little shout out, and you know, uh, same way they do on the East Coast, man, or the or well, the West Coast for that matter too. So they always talk about all the the West Coast legends and everything too. So you know, but um, 
You know? yeah, I mean, that's why I wanted to have you on here. You know what I'm saying? Because I, yeah. like, I know like all this shit mm-hmm. is all tied in. You know what I mean? I know like that whole era of that Kids Jam era, that Houston mm-hmm. hip hop era, like that. You know, spawned so many other things in the city. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, it, it also spawned the, the skating rinks too. We started the skating rinks off too. You know, we after Kids Jam, uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We get off at 10 uh, 2 p.m. Later on that night, every Saturday night, we go to Rainbow Skating Rink. Hmm. Yeah, but what Rain- was this at? This was on the north side. Yeah. Rainbow, rainbow on the north side. Saturday night is all the way live. Michael Mitchell, Jazzy Red, and Terry T mixing and scratch so viciously. That was Lester's rap, man. He did a commercial. Man, <laughs> that's live. <laughs> that's live. Lester did a commercial, man. Every Saturday night, man, we go to Rainbow. That was a popular commercial, man. Everybody seen that shit, man. Rainbow, rainbow on the north side. You know, Lester had that voice. That, and uh, we do that commercial, man. Every Saturday night, we go to Rainbow and we do the skate. And a dance, you know, and uh, man, it, it was huge, man. It was, man, that was a big skate rink. Bo Broussard, man, rest in peace. He used to own Rainbow, uh, Rainbow Skate Rink, and then he owned another one. And when I, uh, when I was home, I lived in Katy, and uh, Bo had another skating rink uh, in Katy. I DJ that years later. I was at Rainbow, then years, years later, I'm bam over at uh, Bo's. Uh, I think the skate rink is still there in Katy. And so we went over there every Saturday night, man. Oh man, it was off the chain. That was during around the Prince era. We had all we had all the dance crews, man. So shout out to the Polo Boys, the Snake Boys, the Santana Boys, all over the dance groups and stuff. Sir Polo, my boy, my my my, my baby brother uh, Paul. Oh man, it was off the chain. We had all girls looking like Vanity and Apollonia, mm. dressing like Prince, and it was crazy. Michael Jackson, and oh man, it was crazy, man. We had all kind of characters, all the dance groups, and everybody in there. Lester was DJing, me and Lester, and uh, man, everybody was there. It was crazy, man. We had Bobby Jimmy and the Critters come there one day. Bobby Jimmy seen Big Butt. It was so many people there, man. They had to shut the street down they had helicopters they had to close the street off and close the, the skating rink and get everybody out it was a fire hazard they shut the hose tidwell and Irvington. they had blocked all the roads off man it was so many motherfuckers trying to get to that to that skating rink man it was ridiculous i was like god bo was like oh my god yeah man That's so, that, crazy. so that kind of spun off one of the first uh, uh skating rinks hmm. so okay talk about because uh this ended up being kind of instrumental in what you had going on too, <laughs> King T being on Kids Jam with y'all, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. King T, man, that's where he started off. When see me and Tila, Tila was it, well, I call him, we call him Tila, but King T, who, who was DJ Terry T, when he was out here in Houston, he lived with me, uh, stayed with me, uh, and my mom uh, at the time for for a while. Tila was like 14 years old. Dope man, one of the baddest DJs. Man, he'll do tricks with a with, with, with turntables, man, you never seen a, a young kid do, man. So mm. it, it was off the chain. He'll take a record, uh, an ashtray, like a little round ashtray, put it upside down, take the record, and uh, put it on top of that ashtray, t- take the needle off the, the record, turn it upside down, put it at the back of the record, and the record, and it plays forward to the front of the record. Crazy mm. shit, I ain't never seen nothing be m- scratching with the other with the other record. It was crazy, man. You have to, you have to, vi- you have to actually visualize that shit and see him do it to to understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's crazy. It was crazy, man. So yeah, so y'all didn't be meet that kids jam. Mm-hmm. If he if he was 14, y'all didn't meet that kids jam then. Tila was there. Yeah, he was there. He what it was. He used to uh, <laughs> he was at a youth home and he used to always run away from the youth home and run and go to kids jam and be on there and Pam always saying get this boy boy go home get away from here you know run like a little kid always running so she'd run him away he'll come back and uh, come stay with me and Lester and uh, stay at the radio station or something like that because he was just like a little 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 problem child running away <laughs> so that motherfucker it's crazy man but he was so dope man we'd get him in clubs and stuff sneak him in the clubs and he'll get on the turntables and just go crazy yeah. um yeah, and he was he was my DJ. You know, when I rap, he did all my scratching and stuff for me. Me and Lester had a group called Double Trouble. 
Uh, we did uh, a couple of songs, a song called This Is My Bass, just messing around on it. We had a little a little drum machine at that time. We was just, just doing some stuff, and I got all that shit on tape, man. I got those songs on tape. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. You got it on MP3? Like, you can send it to me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah I okay. do. I do. And I'll shoot it to you, let yeah. you hear. This is my bass. But dum dum. We had a little keyboard, a little, uh, a little drum, a little Casio drum machine, and uh, somebody was doing the keyboards, playing the keyboards or something. It was, it was it was jamming, mm. so uh, yeah, I'll let you hear all that. But uh, yeah, Teela was at uh, he was at uh, uh, Kids Jam, KTSU DJ Terry T, and, we, and 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 ironically, we did a little. We were just playing around one day. We just called ourselves the Screw and the Bone, DJ Screw and MC Bone. <laughs> I was crazy. I was MC Bone. He was DJ Screw. This was in '84, man, '85. You know, That's like crazy. yeah, I'm like, damn, who would thought that late years later. Robert would call himself DJ Screw. I don't know if he got that from us. I don't think he, cause he was he was a, he was a little man. Screw was Screw probably had to be. We was like 21, I mean, 19, 20, 21. Screw probably was. I mean, he was in Smithville too. He didn't live. Four or five. Yeah, he, was young. <laughs> he probably was three or four or five. I don't know. Probably a teenager at that time. You know what I'm saying? But either way, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, crazy. yeah, it was it was just ironic that, that 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 happened like that. But yeah, we were just, you know, it wasn't nothing we was just officially calling ourselves. We were just fooling you know, just bullshitting one day and just saying, now I'm D MMC Bone, DJ Screw. And I, I say it on my on one of my raps. Hmm. I even say that in my rap. So yeah, yeah. It's crazy, man, how how history, you know, just kinda uh, all that stuff just kind of line up together, like like you was mentioning. So yeah, it's does a he, lot, man. Does he end up going to the West Coast first, and then you kind of like tagging along, like every now and then going out there, like before you really do like dope fiend and all those mm -hmm. types of things. Like talk about like that whole time period. Yeah, that's 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 actually how I I got to California. Tila went to California first. He left. And uh, he went out there, and <laughs> which is crazy. That's why uh, a lot of his first records, I I, I wrote them. I co-wrote uh, a lot of that stuff because he used all my raps when he went. <laughs> all the shit that I was rapping about on the radio, he took my raps and used them on his record. <laughs> I say, motherfucker, <laughs> and 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 B two Omega called me and say, man, Terry Tatum went to New uh, 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 California man using all your shit. I'm like, what are you talking about? You, you using all your raps, man. And then I heard the song. He's like, yeah, man. I, you know, but it was it was it was all you said B2 good. B two born twice. Yeah, born twice, man. Mm -hmm. B two Omega born twice. I'm sorry, I called him by his, his early early mm -hmm. rap name, B two Omega. Oh, born twice, man. Yeah, uh, called me up and told me that shit. I'm like, man, what? So you know, it was all good though. But um, yeah, so um, he went there. He went to California. Called me up. Said, man, you want to come to California? Then he they flew me out. You know, I was staying with DJ Pooh. And uh, Mixmaster Spade, my my brother, man. Shout out, rest in peace, Mixmaster Spade. Uh, How was that? Because I mean, you talking about you staying with DJ Pooh, you on mm -hmm. Mixmaster Spade like this? You know what I mean? These, mm -hmm. these West Coast legends, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, them my homeboys, man. I live with them guys, man. I live with uh, Pooh and uh, Teela was living with Pooh at the time, and uh, and I went and stayed. When I stayed, I was I was down there with Teela, so I was staying with with him and uh, Pooh. Oh man, when you see Pooh work, if you ever seen, if you ever heard some of the stuff, the early stuff Teela got like co rock stuff and and uh um bass and all those songs that king t did if you would see how if you can just see Pooh working on those songs crazy on that uh that uh sp 1200 mm. drum machine man he was crazy on that thing man Pooh is a is a uh one of the dope one of the dopest underrated producers man yeah he he, he done a lot of stuff man he, he cold still cold so uh yeah man dj Pooh. And I hung with everybody. I was with everybody on, when I was on the West Coast, man. Uh, Bobcat, you know, DJ with LL, Bob, and it was just like just boys, man, just hanging, you know, living together, hanging out, and doing all kind of shit together. So, yeah, Easy. Shit, I, I wrote a song for Easy E. Oh, uh, shit. Called, um, well, Toddy T took it and used it, Living on the Edge of Insanity. I wrote that song because when I went uh, to Ruthless and, uh, Hung out with E and M, DLC, did shows and stuff. Hang out with them niggas when they did shows at some of the clubs and stuff in uh, in L.A. Water the Bush Club, just a lot of clubs that we was at doing stuff, man. Hanging out. Doc was on the set, video set when they were shooting uh, some of the videos, the N.W.A. videos and all that stuff. So yeah, man, I was there, man, and all that. Yeah. 
That's a trip. Okay, so talk about the talk about the the dope fiend. I'm a dope fiend. The classic. You know what I'm saying? Because the record, you did it way earlier than it really came out to everybody else and like blew mm -hmm. up, blew up like yeah. a few years before that. Mm -hmm. I, I first recorded the album, my first album with uh, Quality Records. Uh, it was uh, called The Spice of Life. That was my first album with the high top fade. If you've seen, uh, suit, yeah. if you've seen uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon. Uh, I was on an episode of Jimmy Fallon do a little thing called uh, Do Not Play, where he'd be cracking on uh, artists, talking about don't play that shit because it's whack or whatever, whatever. But I was on Jimmy Fallon doing that. He was clowning. He just knew my whole song. He was word for word. He was singing my song. I was like, damn. And um, so uh, when I got to California, I, you know, I met Toddy T. Of course, I was hanging out with Toddy T and uh, Spade and all those guys. And Todd had got us a deal with uh, Quality Records. Which was uh, distributed through Capital. That's how, I'm, you know, that's how me and uh, Tila, uh, how I got as far as uh, writing and stuff, and doing stuff for Tila through Capital, because he was on. Tila was signed to Capital, and we were distributed through Capital. And um, so when I got to, uh, uh, when me and Todd got together, he got us that deal over at Quality Records, uh, which was a new company. Man, it, the company was new. It was based uh, in Canada, and. Um, Russ Regan, uh, rest in peace to Russ. He was uh, uh, the the CEO at that time. And uh, shit, man, we just was uh, working on this album. My first song I put out on, on that album was, was Beach Girl. That album came out in 1989. Um, Beach Girl, we did a video for that. It was dope. It's online. You can go Google Jazzy Red Beach Girl and, and check out the uh, Beach Girl video. Um, and Monique Manning is was my leading lady. She's mm. uh Monique is a, a beautiful dancer, man. She's so beautiful. She she uh, danced on Prince videos and she's done coming to America. She's a model and an actress, so she was on. I was so happy to have her in in the video. We still cool. We still talk to this day. Still friends. And uh, Elvis Fly got in the studio, did that Beach Girl song, did the video. Was getting ready to do it. Put out another single. We had to finish the album. So Todd was like, man, I got this song. Todd, actually, Toddy T wrote that song. The, I'm a dope fiend. Todd said, man, I got a song that I was going to use, man. Shit, we got we pressed for time on that. Let's go ahead and do it. Verses and everything, not just the hook, everything. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, he wrote he wrote the whole song. And I was like, man, I don't know, because I ain't never had nobody write a song. I ain't never uh, rapped nobody else shit before. So I'm like, I don't know, dog. Let me hear it. What, what is it? Song called I Am a Dope Fiend. I was like, man, come on, dog. I, 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 come on, man. Come on now. <laughs> no, nah, Ty, that's your song. You use your shit. That's your shit. I don't want to. He said, man, let's just, we ain't got this all we got for right now. Let's go ahead and do this. Drop this on the album. So we did the song. And uh, as those stories go, you know, the songs that people never want to use or don't like be, turn out to be their biggest songs. So this turned out to be my biggest song, man. I'm a dope fan. We sold close to 500,000 units on that song. Uh, the album did good. Shit, even my Beach Girl song peaked in the top, the top, uh, top 100, in the top 100 on Billboard. Yeah, man. So, um, dope fan was good, man. You hear, you know, the saxophone mm -hmm. that's played in that song. You, you know, this, this, this. Amazing saxophonist named Cal Bennett from uh, L.A. Man, he played. It was like a toy, a little plastic toy saxophone that he used on that on that song. I was like, damn, and that shit sounds so good. Mm. He was dope, man. It was it was it was a nice, like expensive toy, but it was plastic, and he used that for the saxophone on that song, man. It came out like that, so I was like, damn. Yeah, he dope. From at, high school, junior high, elementary. <laughs> what? Yeah, man. So that turned out to be a great song. We did a video, shot a video D. for it. Yeah. But what was, what was the thing with the whole, like, with the break in it? Because, it, like you said, it came out in 89, but it didn't hit to, like, what, like, 91? Well, 89, what happened in 1989, uh, the album came out. It was it was a whole album. Then we, we, we put an EP out in 90, in 90 1990, we, we put an EP out. And it had the Dope Fiend song on it again. And so what happened was I took the shit to 97.9 in the box. And Jimmy Olsen, my little white brother, was on the air. <laughs> and I gave him the song. Jimmy played that song. And that's what sparked it off in Houston. And he was well, 102? Jimmy was on 97.9. You say 97.9, yeah, 97.9. Yeah. So Jimmy played the song on on the box, man. And it went, it blew up and went crazy. So I was like, damn. And uh, but I was doing shows. I was, you know, I had did a, a regional tour, a southeast, a south, uh, a southern region tour. Uh, I did a west coast uh, tour. I was out on the west, 
San Francisco. Jimmy was out in San Francisco with me too. He was out there and Jimmy everywhere, man. He always be everywhere. Everywhere I go, it seems like I find Jimmy ass <laughs> right there. Uh, uh, so yeah, I had I was already doing uh, shows and stuff and traveling and everything. You know, doing promo stuff for the uh, song. Dallas, I was everywhere, man. I did a show in Dallas, man. It had like 70,000 people there at that time. Um, Arrested Development, uh, Lighter Shade of Brown was on the show. And it, it, it was it was several different uh, 90s uh, rappers on the show. It was, that was dope. I was like, wow, that was, I think, uh, probably one of the biggest shows I've done. Uh, almost 100,000 people at, at, at a uh, concert, outdoor venue. Mm. It was dope. So, yeah, man. Um, so came back out in ninety and then uh sparked off again. So by ninety one, uh it, it we did the video right after that big thing, then uh we we shot that video. It was a little late. We did the video late, promoted it, didn't promote it good enough. It, it did okay, but the record company was so new, it hit them so fast, they didn't know how to market it, they didn't know what to do with, with that song, you know. So it did what it did basically on its own. So <clears throat> which I'm glad for. <clears throat> Did a whole big segment on Fox 26, City on the Siege, uh, that show. Still trying to find the archives and find that video. Uh, nobody seemed to get Fox. If y'all find find that video, Fox, come on, man, I need that. City on the Siege. Uh, Stephanie Frederick was the uh, anchor, the reporter at that time. She was interviewing me. We walked through Fourth Ward, uh, my mama house, and all that. Man, well, she was asking about. Tell us about the crack, Mister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, I don't know about no crack. <laughs> yeah, it was just crazy, man. So yeah, that that, that sparked off the whole. Um, uh, second wave of, of I'm a Dope. And like I said, it was just on the album at first. It wasn't really a single or nothing until we did the EP. And uh, that's what sparked it off from that point. Mm. Yeah. Man, so after that, I mean, how did, what, what, what did you end up doing like after the, you know what I'm saying, Dope Fiend? Because you had a big smash and then kind of just, you know, went back to, I guess, just doing regular shit or like what happened? DJing or, or what did you end up doing after that? Well, what happened with that? <clears throat> After Dope Fiend, uh, um, uh, after I left Quality, I came back home, uh, came here. I released um, another EP, another album, uh, EP called Mile High Madness. Uh, you can see me on the cover with the fourth ward, the sign in, uh, right there in fourth ward. And I did the Voice of Authority album, did a whole album, did that on Stone Records. Uh, shout out to my man KC. Um, he uh, owned the record label. We did, it's an independent label. So, um, you know, like I said, still didn't get a lot of promotion, promotion. But, you know, I got those albums out there all online, too. If you want to go check some of those songs out, The Voice of Authority and the Mile High Madness EP. Um, and was still recording, still recording to this day. You know, I still was re recording then. And then what happened uh, was we had a, they had a, a celebrity thing on, on the radio, 97.9 in the box. They were dating celebrities, like local celebrities come uh, record. Uh, rappers come and take over the radio for a day, jump on the radio. I got a call to, to come jump on that. Lil' Kiki and some other, I forgot who else. I don't know, Paul. It was somebody, some other rappers that was on there, too. And uh, Rob, what year is this? This in the 90s? This, this, was, like, this was in, uh, like, old... This was in 05. Because during 96, after after the Dope Fiend song, after 91 at 2, 3, 4 and all that, I was still recording. I just did a lot of records. I was just recording a lot of stuff. Like I said, I did those albums and that, that EP, my stuff in 93, 4, 5, 6 and all that. And was just um, DJing and doing stuff, you know, doing uh, other stuff, acting. Jumped into a couple of little plays and... I uh, was on Robert Townsend's uh, Five Heartbeat movie. When I was that's when I was in California, I did that. And uh, were you in the Dirty Third too? MC Hammer story, Dirty Third. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was on yeah. that too. Me yeah. and uh, T Gray, I was in prison. Yeah. And yeah. T Gray was the feet, was serving mm -hmm. the food and so. stuff. Talking man, they, shit. They cut so much of that shit out of there. I was like, man, T Gray was clowning in there, T. man. T Gray was talking shit in yeah, there. That was yeah. funny as hell. Yeah. yeah, so they they cut us out of that. They cut they cut a lot of the scenes out, but I, I was still in there. So. They did the MC Hammer story. I did some extra work on that and uh, Robert Town. You was in there, Brian Poppy. Yeah, yeah. I was in the not in as a main actor, but we did some some background work. But I'm you see me, I'm all in there visible. I had a little baby fro because I was growing my my twists and my braids at that time. Had my little baby fro. Had like a look a little Versace shirt on, a, a fake Sachi. <laughs> <laughs> had my fake Sachi on, and uh, in the church scene, I was in the MC Hammer when they was at the 
doing the pumps in the bump video. I was a cameraman, boom guy holding the boom mic. I was all kind of shit, man. Yeah. Little, uh, what's the guy named to play Tupac? Hakeem to play it on, on Moesha. Mm -hmm. What was his name? I forgot his uh, real name. Uh, uh, um, he, he, then he passed away. He passed yeah, I think away, he passed yeah. away. He was in, the, he was playing Tupac at that time. Me and him was hanging out. I got pictures. I seen, I seen you all that stuff. So, uh, yeah. And, um, so, um, what, what were we talking about? We was, um, you saying 05 and then, or somewhere and then oh, to the radio. Then oh, old, key key and oh, 05, we was getting ready to do the, the, the celebrity, the, the radio takeover thing. And I got a call from, uh, the program director at 97 the, the box at that time was Tom Calicochi. Love Tom, man. I love Tom. He's one of the coolest, um, just down to earth. He was always up front with me and honest and, and about everything that he said. And, uh, I say, Man, I heard you on the on the thing, man. Um, how would you um like to do a weekend here at the station? Work weekends. I say doing what? He said on the air, just doing weekends. He said it ain't gonna be a lot of money, but you know you have opportunity to you know make money. I was already popular and known, you know, because I had my record out and I had been DJing all around the city. And um, and I said and I thought about it, man. I called him back the next. I said, yeah, man, let's go ahead and uh, I'll do that. Let me go ahead and do that. So I got on in 97 out of the box. I was there for almost five years and uh, did weekends. I did uh, filled in for everybody. G-Man, Carmen, Hatter, Cracker Nuts. Shit, I, I was on. I was all over the board. I was a go-to when they had to call somebody to fill in. G-Man uh, had to take off. I couldn't be that jazzy. Uh, fill in for, can you fill in for G-Man? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. So I kind of worked all around the board, man, and uh, uh, just um, – had had fun, man. I was exposed. That was my first. You know, I did radio back in the day, but it was college radio. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, uh, like commercial radio. We wasn't. It wasn't. We wasn't organized, and we were just <laughs> on there doing what we wanted to do. See, it was a whole different thing. And when I got there, bass man, rest in peace, uh, showed me a lot. He he thought I knew so much about radio. I said, you know, I was college. That was <laughs> that was play radio. I don't know nothing about all this shit. And this is a whole new world for me. So. Um, uh, he kind of showed me the ropes, man, and just just taught me a lot on, as far as you know, uh, intros, outros, back sell, front sell, and all that kind of stuff. As far as your records and stuff, so yeah, man, and uh, just a lot of great people, man. But I love I love ninety seven nine the box, man. I had so much fun up there, man, and it was um it, it it was just a great experience and a great time at that time. Um, and then after Tom left, Terry Thomas came in and and, and stepped in as a program director, and um. You know, um, I just got an opportunity to meet so many people, man. I interviewed R. Kelly, you know, interviewed uh, Chris Brown when he was 16 years old. His first little record was out, excuse me, and uh, that first one. Run it and all that. Run it and all that stuff. Yeah, man. So a lot of, you meet a lot of great people, man, you know, because we're in the big city, man, and, uh, you know, a lot of people just stop through and just interview Puffy. I was, I was, I was kind of intimidated. Puffy kind of scary, man. If you meet him in person, he's a little... Uh, intimidate, not not scared to the, you know, like like kind of like damn, you know, this puff and he's, you know how authoritative he is and he was make you a little nervous, you know, but you know puffy cool man, so just had a great opportunity to meet a lot of people, learn a lot as far as radio. So when I left, uh, uh, ninety seven nine the box and went to Beaumont and uh, jumped on uh, Magic one hundred two point five. I had I had a lot of uh, experience. I, I knew a lot as far as radio and stuff. So, yeah. So that was, that was a great transition from from radio to, to from rapping to to radio, which I was still doing, you know. But radio became uh, first and consistent. So that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. That's what it is, man. That's what keeping it, is. it pushing, keeping it moving. For sure, for sure, <laughs> well, man. You got anything up before we close up, man? Man, um. What else are we talking about? Oh, we coming up. Uh, we coming up this this April. I'll be here real soon, right? So mm -hmm. for those that don't know, uh, 2019, uh, Mayor uh, Turner, I uh, got the proclamation for uh, Jazzy Red Day mm -hmm. in the city of Houston. It's April the 14th. So uh, I'm planning, trying to plan some of the last couple of years. You know, we got hit with the pandemic and a couple of other things happened. I wanted to, to do something uh, big for, you know, some community stuff here like I've been doing for all my career, always doing community stuff. And uh, so I'm trying to uh, come up with something real fly to do for uh, for April the 14th. Chancey yeah. Red Day in the city of Houston. So make sure you mark that on your calendars. April 14th, uh, that is. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, uh, 
That's it, man. Also, just got here with the Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award, hey, too, man. So I want to say man. uh shout-out to Miss uh, Verna Caddy and uh, DJ Pied Piper, man, and uh, everybody there. Man, it was in a room full of so many uh, intelligent, smart people, man. It was just a great – it was overwhelming because the room was so – dope man it was mm. it was just set up so fly so you know just got to hang out with a lot of people that i didn't ne never probably didn't hang out with before and just you know just mashed it up with them and chopped it up and man we had a had a great time so yeah just still doing it man still recording too so you know if you want to jump on uh, youtube and check out some 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 jazzy red some new shit check it out uh got a song called cool like john man proud uh Natural high, got make a lot, love lot, in the rain, lot, lot of new it? stuff. Make love, we can make love in the rain, and video for that, and just, just, just still doing all my Christmas songs, man. I got, I got obsessed with Christmas songs mm -hmm. when I heard, you know, uh, Christmas rap and Curtis Blue and Run DMC. I always wanted to do a Christmas song, so I did. I got three. I got a new one out now. It's uh, called uh, the Little Drummer Boy. My son is in there, man. So you can go check the video out for that. Add some new Christmas songs to your playlist for this year coming up. So that's it. And just still doing it, man. Catch me on all the social media platforms and just holler at your boy. That's what it is. That's yes, sir. I already, man. With Jazz, man, it's an honor to have you come through, man. Man, I'm so happy to be in the studio, man. I'm on the building. We'll have to get some uh, some artists in here and drop some more uh, some more uh, add some more stuff to this <laughs> beautiful shrine right here, dog. Yes, sure. sir. Sure. I really, I really <laughs> hey, appreciate man. it, D man, for having me, man. man Thank you so much, you man. man. Y'all check out my man Donnie Houston, man. And somebody was act telling me, uh, say Donnie Houston, is that a that I know him he on TV? I say not Donnie Simpson. God damn it, <laughs> Donnie Houston. <laughs> that's a cold name, though, man. That name is is that your real last name? Nah, Houston. Nah, that's you nah. say, but that's nah. that's a cold name, man, though, man. Donnie it, man. Houston. It, it sounds like something, ladies and gentlemen. Right now, it's Donnie Houston, <laughs> and just <laughs> just throw you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you, dog. Appreciate it. Yeah, hey, man, man. it's Donnie Houston Podcast, Jazzy Red. Hey, man, we're up out of here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Donnie Houston. Subscribe to Donnie Houston Podcast, man.